This channel is part of the History Hit Network. It was one of history's bloodiest battles. A clash between two legendary generals. It only lasted a single day, but it shaped the map of Europe for a century. Okay. I've always been interested in the story of Waterloo, especially since I played the role of Richard Sharp. Bang. A British rifleman in the Napoleonic Wars. The South Essex will advance! Right shoulders forward! March! Sharp's adventures were based on real events that happened here 200 years ago. In these programmes, I'll find out more about the men who inspired that character. These pictures are incredible. Not the generals who led the battle, but the ordinary soldiers who fought it. If that went through, you'd smash it to pieces, well, wouldn't it? How are you? I'll discover their eyewitness what? accounts and get a ground-level view of the battle that changed history. He is it ringing. <laughs> I'll test their weapons. Good. Excellent. And meet modern-day soldiers who know what it's actually like to fight for real. To actually hold a lead ball that ended someone's life. That's mm -hmm. a very sobering thought. Waterloo is one of the most famous names in the history of battle. I want to know what it was like to be here 200 years ago, the day history was made. My Waterloo adventure begins in Chatham, in the southeast of England. These history enthusiasts are rehearsing for a huge reenactment of the battle to mark its 200th anniversary. Some of them have ancestors who were there when the French army of Napoleon Bonaparte locked horns with an international force under the British general, Lord Wellington. It's pretty scary stuff, that. Seeing all those uniforms kind of reminds you that it wasn't just the British, although they were the major kind of influence, but it's also the Dutch, the Germans, the Prussians, all fighting on the same side against Napoleon. It's loud, isn't it? Three months before Waterloo, Napoleon had escaped from exile. He'd been held on the island of Elba, after a 20-year quest to make France the top dog in Europe. Now he planned to attack Brussels in Belgium, where Wellington was assembling an army with his Prussian ally, General Blücher. The endgame played out a few miles to the south of Brussels, near the village of Waterloo. The battle that took place here was the first in history to be recorded in so much detail by so many soldiers. The eyewitnesses tell stories of incredible bravery. They reveal what it was like to be a soldier at Waterloo. They make sense of the chaos of war. Their stories will be my guide as I try to see the battle as they saw it at the time. And not just the fighting, but the waiting as well. On the night before the battle, the locals fled their villages as thousands of soldiers converged for the fight and wondered what tomorrow might bring. Private Tom Morris feared the worst, but his sergeant reassured him. Tom, he said, I'll tell you what it is. There is no shot made yet for either you or me. And it will be a sleepless night for the generals too. So this is Wellington's headquarters? Yeah, this is where he spent the night before the battle. Um, and it would have looked pretty much like this, Sean, actually. I suspect it hasn't yeah. changed that much. Wow, it's amazing to think he spent his last few hours in here, isn't it? Yeah, and you, you see the picture behind you there of Wellington on Copenhagen, his horse, and that's yeah. pretty much how he would have looked all the way through the battle the following day. Mm. We know, he, he knows he's got a long day ahead of him in the battle tomorrow, so, you know, there's a lot of thinking going on, and he did most of it in this room up here, so. Oh. 
History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. So here we are in Wellington's HQ, Sean. Um, and this apparently was the room in which he spent his final night before the battle. Not necessarily on that bed, and of course they've got a depiction of him here. Wow. What do you think of the likeness? An amazing resemblance to Hugh Fraser, who played Wellington <laughs> in Sharp. <laughs> really? He really does, yeah. I wonder if they mould that from Looks him. Like him. But actually, if you look from the side, Sean, you can see <laughs> the most distinctive feature of Wellington, that, of course, His is nose, nose, yeah. Hugh Fraser used to put a false one on every morning. I don't think he liked that very much. <laughs> really? <laughs> it was necessary. Wow, it's amazing to think this is where Wellington spent the night before that battle and all, all that expectation of a nation on his shoulders. And this is where he was, yeah. There's a lot riding on the battlefield. But he has one big advantage, and the advantage is over here. Come and have a look at this, Sean. This is a copy, actually, of the actual map he used to plot the defensive position at Waterloo. But the story of the map's pretty amazing, actually, because even a year before the battle, Wellington ordered this map to be prepared. Why? Not because he necessarily thought he was going to face Napoleon, but because he wanted a military survey of the Netherlands. It was a place the British Army yeah. had fought many times in their history, just in case. And when it was clear that Napoleon was back on the loose, he'd escaped from Elba, he instructed the work on this map to continue apace. And I don't know if you can see, it's stitched together from lots and lots of different really? pieces. You mean like that? Exactly. Yeah. A different Royal Engineer officer would have been in charge of each of those sections. Eventually it was all put together in a hurry because he realised from the 16th onwards, when the fighting begins against the French, that he's probably going to have to fight a defensive battle against Napoleon. Two days before Waterloo, the French fought with the British at Quatre Bras, 10 miles further south, and with the Prussians at Ligny. They beat the Prussians and forced them back to the village of Wavre. The British retreated north to a better defensive position near the village of Waterloo. It was only now, less than 48 hours before the battle, that Wellington knew for sure where his showdown with Napoleon would take place. It's tiny Waterloo up there, isn't it? I mean, it's like, with all this big map and Waterloo's right up there on the edge. Well, it's lucky that you've still got a little bit on it that enabled him to use the, yes. the, these positions. Wellington must have been thinking the night before as he lay in this room that the possession of this map and the knowledge it gave him, it might just make the difference the following day. Yeah. While Wellington plotted, his men tried to rest. Most spent the night without shelter in the pouring rain. We were up to our knees in mud and stinking water, wrote army medic William Gibney. But not a drop of drinking water or a particle of food was to be found in the villages. We had to settle down in the mud and the filth as best we could. We got some straw and boughs off the trees, and with these, we tried to make a rough shelter against the torrents of rain that fell all night. And when morning came, Gibney and his mates would face the battle of their lives. Coming up next... Bang. I find out what damage a Waterloo musket can do. The bone is disintegrating on impact. The limb would have to be removed. It's the morning of the battle, and thousands of soldiers are preparing for the fight. One of them is teenager Matthew Clay. He wrote a journal about his experiences at Waterloo that his family still treasures today. So, uh, Christine, tell me about your ancestor, Matthew. Matthew was one of seven children. Age 18, he went down to London and joined the Third Foot Guards, the Scots Guards. And then they had the orders that Napoleon was uh, on the move, so they all went over to, to Belgium. To Waterloo, yeah. yeah. They were all young men, weren't they? They were. 
In the early hours of June the 18th, Matthew and his comrades were ordered to report to the farm at Hugomont. He would spend the day defending these buildings from repeated French attacks and play a part in one of the battle's crucial turning points. But first, it was time to find breakfast. Well, they were absolutely starving. And then it tells you about, mm. um, about the food. The sergeant of each section gave a small piece of bread about an ounce. So how much no, is it? No, not when you're starving. <laughs> to each man, and inquiry was made along the ranks for a butcher. One having gone forward, he was immediately ordered to kill a pig, which having been slaughtered was divided amongst the company, a portion of the head in its rough state being my share, <laughs> and having placed it upon the fire, the heat of which served to dry out our clothing and accoutrements, and to cook our separate portion of meat, which having become warmed through and blackened with smoke, I partook of a little, but finding it too raw and unsavoury, having neither bread nor salt, I put the remainder in my haversack. <laughs> He did try it. it. Yeah, he did try it a bit later. Yeah. When he cooked it for a second time, I think there was uh, a part of a body, a human body, and with all the uh, bits of firewood and stuff, what you know, what they were cooking. So, it. but you, you just can't imagine that day. As Matthew packed his kit, he paid special attention to his musket. It had taken a soaking during the night. So he fired a test shot to check it was working. He knew his life would depend on it in the hours to come. I've used plenty of working replicas over the years, but I don't know how it feels to fire a genuine weapon in the heat of battle. But this man does. He's Corporal Chris Meek of the Rifle Brigade. So how long have you been in the rifles, Chris? So I've been in the rifles 10 years now, and I currently train new recruits who are joining the rifles. Where's that? Is that you saying Patrick? Yeah, uh, Patrick, yeah. Before he became an instructor, Chris did three tours of duty in Afghanistan. He's joining me at the Royal Armouries in Leeds to see the weapons used by his predecessors at Waterloo. Oh, there's so many, so many rifles. <laughs> I've shot a few replicas in my time. And make a lot of noise and look good and very well made, but to be surrounded by these rifles that have actually been shot in anger and to think that maybe your life or someone else has depended on it, it's quite scary, it's quite weird. Most of Wellington's infantry used muskets at Waterloo. I'm going to find out what it's like to fire one of these original weapons, loaded with live ammunition. But first, it's time to meet an old friend. So I'm uh, putting the white gloves on now. So this must be the, uh, the real McCoy, Mark. Absolutely. Let me hand you a Baker rifle, similar to the one uh, you would have been used to. Yeah, I've used replicas. It was on Sharp. That's quite different. <laughs> I feel very, uh, it's very slim, isn't it? Very sleek. Uh, it's much, I don't know, it seems heavier, but it's very mu much finer, much slimmer kind of gun. And Chris, here is a musket of the same period. It's very front heavy, isn't it? I mean, it, to get it into a fire position, it feels quite heavy at the front, so it'd be quite a strain on your arm. So, uh, yeah, I can't quite remember these sights. Ah, oh, but uh, the 1805 model, which is the one you're handling, is fitted with folding sights, so you can yeah. have two different uh, Good, distances to aim at. You see this, Chris? Do you know yeah. what that's for? No, no idea. You can get it open. So we put the, uh, I think the patches, wasn't it? Absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, patch, of course, is a little square bit of uh, cloth which you can wrap around your musket ball, which allows you to uh, load it with a very tight fit. And that, that's ready to go in. It would be, yes. I've had some powder in it. <laughs> <laughs> Bang. Brilliant. Mark and his team of weapon experts have been testing their Waterloo guns to find out how deadly they were. <laughs> They're firing live ammunition into materials that mimic the density and composition of human flesh, muscle and bone. We hope that we'll be able to show the type of wounding that a flintlock musket ball can cause.
these slow motion images are shocking. It's showing quite clearly that the bone is disintegrating on impact. The limb would have to be removed. There is no bone left. Terrifying, really. You can see the bone flexing yeah, as the as bullet it, as approaches. It's approaching. I feel a bit sick. That is absolutely horrific. You don't want to get hit by this. The power of a musket is terrifying at close range. But how easy was it for a soldier like Matthew Clay to hit his target? Who better to test their accuracy than a modern army sharpshooter? The India Pan musket weighs almost exactly the same as a modern army combat rifle. So adopt the kneeling position, just as you normally would. But the Waterloo weapon was notoriously unreliable. If the mechanism got wet, the gun might not fire at all, as Matthew Clay would later discover to his cost. Good shot. That is actually, in the right circumstances, <laughs> with the, the right man. Yeah, strong shoulder. <laughs> you can hit the target. What was that like? It's quite a, quite a recoil on it, a lot more than what I'm used to, yeah. Yeah, it's a like boom, isn't it? Yeah, and the, the smoke cloud after. Yeah. You take a couple of seconds to see if you actually hit the guy. That's a pretty good shot, eh? Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. What if I can do it? Yeah, it's all go now, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so drop down, get comfortable, nice and stable. I keep the uh, muzzle pointing down the range at all times now, because it is loaded. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Pulling it well into the shoulder, because this does kick. Yeah. And then the last step is make ready, which means you bring that to full cock. That's it. Right. Right. Fire. Oh. <laughs> it is a very strong trigger. That, that is, isn't it? Right, just let me get Good. Excellent. So you hit what you're aiming at. Yeah, it's quite a big blast, isn't it? So how does that compare to firing a blank charge? On it's a, different, on TV, yeah, so. very different. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. much more of a, an, an impact, you know, with all your senses around you. I, I should imagine in those days when they were firing stuff like that and there was maybe hundreds or thousands going off, it must have been just kind of, the, the air must have just been resonating with the sound. And, uh, it's hard to imagine the, the noise, um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's just off the paper, but the human body is a lot bigger than a piece of paper. So you've, you know, that's killed your target. Yeah. The target is dead. Coming up next, the battle begins, and I'm roped in to join a Waterloo gun crew. I'm finding out what it was like to be a soldier at Waterloo 200 years ago, and now I'm heading for one of the key locations on the battlefield. We are going to take a very bad road right in the middle of the field. My guide is George Jacobshagen. He's involved in a charity that's restoring the historic buildings at Hougamont Farm. The day before the battle, it, there have been dreadful rains like we have had yes. this morning. It's probably similar to the yeah. conditions to what, yeah. <laughs> See, how to what it is like today. Imagine having to drag massive cannons through, through this sludge. You see, that's Hougamont appearing there. To understand why Hougamont was so important, you need to know about the rest of the battlefield too. Napoleon's forces were massed in the south. Wellington's troops faced them from the high ground to the north. This ridge was a strong defensive position. It allowed Wellington to hide many of his troops, making it hard for the French to target their artillery. And French infantry and cavalry would have to climb a steep slope to reach the enemy. Wellington also controlled the farm at Le Hay Saint and the buildings at Hugomont, where Matthew Clay was stationed. From here, the Allies could shoot crossfire and disrupt the flow of Napoleon's attacks. If Wellington kept control of these outposts, he had a good chance of holding off the French until his Prussian allies arrived from the east. 
It looks like a building site while the restoration happens, but you can understand why Wellington thought it crucial to defend this place, whatever the cost. So this looks quite an impressive uh, building. You can see why Wellington put so much importance on it as a stronghold. Quite an impressive building indeed. There was the farm and the barn here. This was always Wellington's tactics to try to hide part of his troops. And when he discovered two days before the battle that there was this place, he prepared it as a sort of fortress. This was where the battle finally began in earnest. Wellington had posted some of his best troops to defend the farm. The buildings were surrounded by other obstacles that made this a difficult place for the French to capture. More Allied soldiers were positioned in the walled garden and orchard to the east. And there was a large wood to the south, defended by some of Wellington's German troops. In the late morning, the French began to fight their way through the woods. Within an hour, they had the farmhouse buildings in their sights. Only a few trees from the original wood are still standing here today. So these trees, these would, these are the edge of the wood? Absolutely. And then from here to there, there's nothing. Nothing. It's just an open space. And Wellington made in the wall some holes yeah. to allow the troops that were inside to shoot at the French that would come out of the woods. So yeah. nobody could possibly pass this stretch of open field. They had no chance. No the chance. French, did they? No. Private Johann Leonard, one of the Allied troops defending Hugomont, described what happened next. We had hardly taken up position at the loopholes when masses of French came out of the wood, apparently all set to capture the farm, but they were too late. A shower of balls that we loosed off on the French was so terrible that the grass in front was soon covered with French corpses. You can still see a hole of a bullet that was shot at that time. Yeah. And which is impressive to, to think that those trees have been witnesses of the heavy fighting that has been taking place here. This is quite a fortress, this, this side of the farm. You can imagine the English with their muskets through those holes. You want them to be a Frenchman attacking this. Unable to break through the south gate, the French turned their attention to the west side of the buildings, where Matthew Clay was stationed with a hundred of his mates. They were heavily outnumbered, but as he tried to retreat back inside the farm, Matthew found himself stranded outside. To make matters worse, his musket was misfiring. He was forced to swap it for another one that lay by the body of a dead comrade. As Matthew later recalled, the new weapon was still warm from recent use and an excellent one. At least it gave him a fighting chance of making it out alive. Meanwhile, less than a mile to the south, near an inn called La Belle Alliance, Napoleon was aiming his sights at the heart of Wellington's defences. So all the allies would be right along that ridge line. Absolutely, and pretty much where you can see the houses there, you see the road going through them. Yeah. That's the centre of Wellington's position. He'd have had troops arranged on both sides, about a mile actually on both sides. But yeah. the bulk of Wellington's army is the other side. And the reason he's got them the other side is because what Napoleon is sighting in this position we're actually on here. From where we are, for a total of about a thousand yards, were sighted cannon after cannon after cannon after cannon. Napoleon loved his cannons. He'd risen through the ranks as an artillery officer, and he knew how brutally effective his so-called beautiful daughters could be. What Napoleon actually wants to do is use these cannon to wear down the enemy. To just bludgeon them. Yeah, it's literally bludgeoning yeah. it, but there's a problem he's got on the day of the Battle of Waterloo, and this is the clue to the problem. If you just yeah. have a look ahead of me here, Sean. I mean, look at, look at this. Completely God, yeah. waterlogged. This, this soil yeah. uh, has taken an That's awful bad, lot, of, lot of rain in the last 24 hours or so, yeah. and it's pretty much identical to what would have happened prior to Waterloo, because for the uh, 24 hours or so, before it, it's just been non-stop rain. Yeah. And the problem with soil like that is you can't manoeuvre guns in it. 
I've been roped in to help move a replica cannon into position. You can see the problems of moving this gun on a relatively dry day. This is Jim Paler. He was a major in the Royal Artillery and is an expert on Waterloo cannons. Yeah. It's heavy, it's hard work. It's hard work. Waterloo artillery was much heavier than this and harder to move through the mud. So Napoleon faced an agonizing wait for the ground to dry before he could get his cannons up and running. But the clock was ticking. He wanted to break through Wellington's defenses before nightfall. And finally, he could wait no longer. Just before noon, he ordered his cannons to open fire. Gun captain, when you're ready, the first thing the attachment commander is going to do is order the gun to be wormed. The worm, wormer, is a big corkscrew. He's going to put that down the barrel and turn it to make sure there's nothing inside there. That will pull out any debris. The worm it? Worm it. It's called oh, worm right. it. It's not a funny word to this, isn't it? <laughs> like worm. You'll notice how he uses it underhand. If something's yeah. going to go off, if you have your hand on the top, yeah. then you're going to lose your arm. The next right. job that's going to happen is a sponge man who is going to wet his sponge will now ram down the barrel and that will extinguish any embers. If the embers weren't put out, the cannon could explode as it was being reloaded. Working at the business end of a Waterloo gun is no job for the faint-hearted, even when it's just a replica. So you can now give it real welly. And if you don't ram this properly, it's not going to fire. And everyone will think you're a big girl, OK? Napoleon had over 250 cannons at Waterloo, 100 more than Wellington. When the barrage began, the thunder of the guns could even be heard in Brussels, 10 miles from the battlefield. Now, if you do that three times a minute, you're going to win. Bloody hell. The heat of the moment, that must be very kind of difficult just to keep your concentration. And when it went off, I nearly got... <laughs> Incredibly loud. Whew, that was amazing, that. My ears are ringing. <laughs> a well-drilled gun crew could fire at a rate of three rounds a minute. I wonder how long it'll take with a new recruit. Gun battery, three rounds, independent, rapid, fire! In the first half hour of the battle, Napoleon launched 3,000 cannonballs at the British lines. Yeah. It was a shock and awe tactic to demoralise the enemy before he sent in his infantry and cavalry to finish the job. I haven't done any yet. First gun finished, timekeeper. I think I must have uh, put, washed it out with a sponge and left too much water in it. Yes! That was just our first round. We managed three shots in the end. The Napoleon would not have been impressed. Number four gun finish. Timing for the first gun finish, please. Two minutes, 50 seconds for the first gun. Timing for the last gun. Nine minutes. Nine minutes. It wasn't my fault the gunpowder didn't fight. <laughs> it's one thing playing soldiers with a replica, but genuine Waterloo cannons were no laughing matter. We persuaded the Royal Armouries to let us fire this 200-year-old gun using live ammunition. We're testing it on an army-approved range on Salisbury Plain, under the supervision of weapons expert Nicholas Hall. This cannon dates from about 1800, so it was in use at the time of Waterloo. I think that could go over the top. Simon West trained as an artillery officer with the British Army. He's fascinated by the experiences of his predecessors at Waterloo. Well, I think we've got a very rare opportunity today to actually see the weapon effects that were delivered by the Royal Horse Artillery at Waterloo. After the French cannons opened fire on Wellington's Ridge, the Allied artillery was eager to fire back. I reckon that's pretty good, actually. OK. But Wellington said no. He wanted to save his ammunition to use at closer range against foot soldiers and horses. I'm optimistic we're going to hit this. 
This will be the first time in 200 years this cannon's been fired with a full charge of powder and a six pound round shot. They'll watch the action from the safety of the control tower and high speed cameras will record the result. Paul Seaton and Mandy Chesterton had ancestors who fought in a Waterloo gun troop. They're about to see what happened when their three times great grandfather, Bombardier Nathaniel Almey, was finally given the signal to fire. Okay, firing in five, four, three, two, one. The sheer velocity of these weapons spread carnage across the battlefield. That ball was traveling at a couple of hundred meters a second and would have created havoc in the enemy lines. One well-aimed shot could rip through a column of infantry and kill as many as 20 men. Our cannonball finally ended its journey 300 meters from where the shot was fired and it took a small hillside to stop it. So that's a good three feet in yep. to solid chalk. If, if that was a, a French cavalryman approaching it, obviously it would have gone straight through him. In the first exchanges of battle, Wellington ordered his artillery to hold fire. But now their time had come, because down in the valley, the French infantry was about to attack. Coming up next, fighting fire with fire. It's not something you think about turning and running. No. No. We stand now and fight. It's early afternoon on the 18th of June, 1815. The Battle of Waterloo has raged across this valley for nearly two hours. Napoleon's cannons are battering the ridge held by Wellington and his allies. The British general is desperate to stand his ground until the Prussians arrive. But the farmhouse at Hougoumont is also under attack by the French. And British teenager Matthew Clay is stranded outside with one of his mates. It was with Private Gann. And Matthew says nice things about him, saying it, it, it was his senior. Them two got stuck outside the gates, and it weren't till one of the officers come in they opened the gates up and they managed to get in. It was a narrow escape. Moments later, a mob of French soldiers, some wielding axes, began to smash the gates. Matthew's journal describes the desperate efforts of his comrades to keep them out. I saw Lieutenant Colonel McDonnell carrying a large piece of wood or trunk of a tree in his arms, one of his cheeks marked with blood. His charger lay bleeding in a short distance with which he was hastening to secure the gates against the renewed attack of the enemy, which was most vigorously repulsed. According to Wellington, the heroic effort of Macdonald and his men made the difference between victory and defeat at Waterloo. Barring the gates against the French ensured this crucial outpost stayed in British hands and Matthew was there when history was made. These are the famous north gates of Hougoumont. It's where the French broke through, where the British repelled them. 200 years ago, this courtyard would have been a place of horror. A handful of French soldiers, trapped inside when the gates closed behind them, were put to the sword by the British. Such a scene of bayonet work I never before or since beheld. One of the British soldiers wrote later, we look like so many butchers red with gore. But amidst the carnage, Matthew Clay performed an act of mercy that saved the life of one French intruder. The enemy's artillery having forced the upper gates, a party of them rushed in who were as quickly driven back, no one being left inside but a drummer boy without his drum, whom I lodged in a stable or outhouse. This drummer boy, you were only, what, you, what 13? Oh, crying, yeah. And he, you, Matthew managed to get him safe. He, he put did, him somewhere yeah. safe. These drummer boys could be anything from, like, 11, 12 yeah. year old. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can't imagine yeah. that young lad being stuck inside doors when all these other the French yeah. are dead, and yeah. he's here like, what do I do? Witness to that, yeah. You should be proud of him. I am very <laughs> proud of him, <laughs> Sean. Yeah. 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 yeah, these lads who fought at Waterloo, it's, it's nice to keep the memory. The French would continue their efforts to capture Hugomont for hours to come. But time was running out for Napoleon because Wellington's Prussian allies were getting closer to the battlefield. The Prussians were marching through mud from the east. It would be hours before they were able to join the battle. But if they made it before nightfall, they could reinforce Wellington's troops on the ridge and also attack Napoleon's forces from the south. If they didn't arrive in time, the French had every chance of breaking Wellington's line. It had been battered by artillery for two hours, and now the French infantry was ready to mount its first attack. So, Sean, sure, we're following in the direction of the first major French attack yeah. the day of the Battle of the Waterloo. The, the cannons at the Grand Battery on the ridge behind us have been softening up the Allied line ahead, and now yeah. it's time to send the infantry in, and they're sending them in in these massive columns. The French always attack in columns because it's easier to manoeuvre that way, and there's also the psychological effect of the defenders seeing this huge mass of troops. How many yeah. men? 2,000 men in a single column. And there's a block here, another one there, and another one over there. And these three massive columns, with the head of the column 48 men wide. So it's all covered, all, all this field is well, it's covered by thousands and thousands of men. All you can see are men, as far as the eye can see, in these solid blocks. And it must have seemed to the defenders on the ridge that they were going to be completely unstoppable. Yeah. Now, cannon are firing at them, so they're taking casualties, these, these columns, but that's not making any difference to them. They're so well disciplined. The men are just falling out, the injured and the, and the killed, and they're carrying on, they're closing up ranks. Slowly but surely, they're getting towards the Allied positions up on the ridge there. Now, up there, just on the ridge lines, we can see ahead of us, there's a big block of uh, Netherlands soldiers, 2,000 of them, put in front of, rather unfairly, I think, by Wellington, in front of the ridge line, and they were the first point of defence. And as these massive columns were getting closer and closer and closer, the Netherlanders were getting more and more spooked. And when they got really close, they just up sticks Did they? And, and left. And they just stream on back through the British line, and all you've got left now are the British soldiers. And the question yeah. is, are they going to be enough to stop the French breaking through the line? His forces were outnumbered, but Wellington trusted his infantry more than any other part of his army. Now was the time to find out if he was right. Ready, ready. Ready. Fire. Fire. Recover. These reenactors are practicing the drills that made Wellington's infantry such Come a formidable on. foe, under the guidance of former Army Rifles Major Rob Ewell. To find out how they prepared for battle, I'm joined by serving soldiers from the Coldstream Guards. Their predecessors fought at Waterloo. So, Rob, I'm just imagining I'm a French soldier, one of the infantry. I've got thousands of my mates each side of me, used to winning. And uh, just going up that hill, I wonder what Wellington's got in store for us on the other side. Yeah, well, um, not what Napoleon's expecting. Napoleon is used to winning against the conscript forces of the European armies, and he's expecting his artillery barrage has already demoralized the enemy forces, so that when you crest the ridge line, you're going to be able to deploy into line um, and destroy the enemy in front of you who are already on the point of breaking. However, you're facing the British Army, which is the only professional army in Europe during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, and which is incredibly well drilled. So, Charlie, this is... Uh... I guess it's nothing new to you, modern day soldier drill. When we're in the field, when we fight, we employ at the very lowest level drills. And so a section battle drill en encompasses everything that you do from the moment you come under fire through to fighting through and clearing the enemy position. It's a one word of command from which a number of actions happen. And it's, it's the same as we see here. And it's, it's designed to remove conscious thought because the yeah. people will be tired, they'll be scared, they'll be under pressure, there'll be a lot of noise and distractions. And if you can have something sort of almost in your muscle memory that you've practised and practised and practised. It means you don't have to uh, think. So we're like uh, modern day robots. Everyone knows what they're doing. Yeah. Just gets on with it. I think the minute we don't do it is when something goes wrong. Yeah. And when it all goes belly up, 
yeah. that individual that's seen something forgets what he's doing as that drill will cost their lives. So with the drill, how does that help you cope with fear? Uh, how do you address that? It's the fear that keeps you sparking. Yeah. It, it's the thing that makes you look out for disturbed uh, command-wise and oh. things like, things like Wait, the out, out of the ordinary. It's that fear that, that keeps that in the back of your mind all the times. And it works in hand in hand with the drill Wait, as well. Ready. Because if you if you sort of be a bit blase about the fear, you then become slack on the drills. Like we alluded to earlier, and that's when mistakes start to get made and things start Fire. to go wrong. I think the, 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 there's definitely a coercive aspect as well because you know, fear is again it's directional. You know, are you more are you more frightened of the enemy or are you more frightened of the consequences of turning and running? And if the consequences of turning and running are some horrible sergeant with a big pike standing behind you, um, yeah, I mean the, the army of 1815 was a flogging army, um, yeah. and our regiment was particularly fond of a lash. You read the punishment book. There was a soldier absent from camp for an afternoon, 350 lashes. You know, that, this is not an army that yeah. tolerates Wait, people turning and running. Yeah. So actually, the threat in front of you hey. is almost less than the threat behind you. Yeah. Um, but also, yeah. they, mates Wait, around I'm you, not... it's yeah, as it is today. You've got other people Come depending on, on you. Yeah. Sure, yeah. It's not something you think about turning and running. No, because well, we don't, do we? No. We stand there and fight. Mate, ready. The firepower of a single, well-drilled infantry unit is impressive enough. If you multiply that by a hundred, it's terrifying. As Napoleon's troops got closer to the ridge, many of their comrades had already fallen victim to the rapid, continuous fire of Wellington's men. Others had been killed or maimed by artillery, but still they marched forward through the trampled crops. The French column is now reaching the front line of the uh, Allied position, the famous sunken lane, which you can see just here. It was actually slightly steeper oh, 200 say, years ago. It looks quiet. It looks quite, quite benign, doesn't it? There, there, was, there was quite a little uh, bank just beyond it, and on top of the bank was a, a big thorn hedge. So they had to scramble their way through the thorn hedge, which is disrupting their formation a little bit. And then all of a sudden, what greets them the other side is the chilling sight of lines of British infantrymen, and behind them, a mass of cavalry. I've seen the terrible damage a single musket can inflict. Now both sides were firing off thousands of rounds a minute at close quarters, and the cannons were still firing too. Artillery officer Alexander Mercer describes the chaos of the battlefield. The air was suffocatingly hot resembling that issuing from an oven. We were enveloped in thick smoke, and despite the incessant roar of cannon and musketry, could distinctly hear around us a mysterious humming noise, like that which one hears on a summer's evening, proceeding from a myriad of beetles. Cannon shot too, ploughed the ground in all directions, and so thick was the hail of balls and bullets but it seemed dangerous to extend an arm, lest it should be torn off. Next time, Huzzah! I test the swords of Wellington's horsemen. Took his ear off. <laughs> I get to grips with Waterloo surgery. Push hard and back gently. And find out why this battlefield discovery is unique. To actually hold a lead ball that ended someone's life. It's mm -hmm. a very sobering thought. It was one of history's bloodiest battles, a clash between two legendary generals. It only lasted a single day, but it shaped the map of Europe for a century. Okay. I've always been interested in the story of Waterloo, especially since I played the role of Richard Sharp. Bang a British rifleman in the Napoleonic Wars. The South Essex will advance! Right shoulders forward! March! Sharp's adventures were based on real events that happened here 200 years ago. In these programmes, I'll find out more about the men who inspired that character. These pictures are incredible. Not the generals who led the battle, but the ordinary soldiers 
equal forty. If that went through, you'd smash it to pieces, Where wouldn't it? How you? Discover their eyewitness accounts and get a ground level view of the battle that changed history. He is a ring. <laughs> I'll test their weapons. Good. Excellent. And meet modern day soldiers. You know what it's actually like to fight for real. It's when you hold a lead ball that ended someone's life. That's mm -hmm. a very sobering thought. Waterloo is one of the most famous names in the history of battle. I want to know what it was like to be here 200 years ago, the day history was made. It's early afternoon on the 18th of June, 1815. The Battle of Waterloo has raged across this valley in Belgium for two hours. The French General Napoleon Bonaparte is attacking an international force led by the British General Lord Wellington. After a brutal artillery barrage, Napoleon's infantry have climbed the hill and come face to face with Wellington's muskets. They almost break through Wellington's defences, but a quick-thinking general changes the course of the battle. You sometimes get in war a crucial moment, the moment where a, a commander has to act, he has to make a decision. And in this case, this monument is to a man called Picton. Picton, he was a very valued, experienced general, wasn't he? I mean, I think Wellington thought quite highly of him. Picton's famous from the Peninsula War, you know, yes. he's probably yeah, I, I uh, Wellington's that. most experienced, toughest, yes. best general. Yes. Uh, and he's in command of the whole of the left wing of the Allied line. And he's right up in the front line with his troops, takes off his hat, waves it, and encourages his men, having fired their initial volley fire, to go in with the bayonet. It's what the French fear, British soldiers using the bayonet. And, and it's at that moment, as he waves his hat, that Picton is shot through the head and killed. He's on his horse and he topples off his horse to the ground, and that's the end of Picton. It was a big blow then, a massive blow. It? it was a blow, but, but what he does that day, and the reason there's a monument erected to him, by that action, driving his troops to the attack, stopping what seems to be an unstoppable force, arguably saves the day, at least for the moment, for the British uh, in terms of Waterloo. Picton's men halted the French advance, but to drive them back down the hill was a job for the cavalry. Wellington had more than 13,000 horses at Waterloo. Some were large, heavy animals, trained to charge en masse at the enemy. Lighter horses were used for other battlefield roles, such as reconnaissance or skirmishing. But sometimes they charged too. All right, so Alan, you're the uh, heavy cavalry, aren't you? Yes. This, one. this yeah. is Felix. Oh, yeah. I'm dressed in the uniform of, of a Scots Grey at Waterloo. Mm -hmm. They're a heavy cavalry regiment. Oh, uh, yeah. Big men on big horses. Yeah. You're the light cavalry. 16th yeah. light dragoons. So they had to be good riders, I guess. Then, as now, the uh, British Army assumed you couldn't ride, started from scratch, and uh, by, the end of, uh, by the end of the process, they produced yeah. blokes That's who could good. ride yeah. One handed, of course. Yeah. Because you have to have your other uh -huh. hand free to yeah. be able to use your sword. Because not only do you need the speed and the movement to bring the horse in on top of on top of the opponent, <laughs> that's half a ton of horse and rider at about 20 to 25 miles an hour. Yeah, but once you're sense. in a melee with a handy fella like yourself, you need to be able to manoeuvre because otherwise you'll just uh, you'll just stick a bayonet into it. Yeah. Just to give some idea from the Frenchman's point of view, basically you've got a big horse and a big oh. man coming yeah, down wow. half a ton of horse and rider <laughs> coming at you at about 20 miles an hour. You're going to be in... pretty the... scary, isn't it? When it came at me like that with a sword, that was uh, <laughs> pretty intimidating. And uh, I don't know what it must feel like on a battlefield in the heat of the battle. That must be uh, absolutely terrifying. It really must be, yeah. I want to take a closer look at the fearsome weapons used in the first heavy cavalry charge against the French infantry. The Royal Armouries in Leeds has several original swords that may have been used in the battle. So what's the difference with these, Henry? This one's kind of been 
It's sharp, it's much more pointed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it. It's been spear pointed. So before the battle, and the night before the battle, the British they were ordered to grind down the backs really? into these spear yeah. points. So these just use these for the Battle of Waterloo. Exactly, yes. All oh, right. These pointed swords were specially adapted to pierce the body armor of French cavalrymen, known as cuirassiers. But using them on horseback was no job for a novice. Before they saddled up for war, Waterloo cavalrymen had weeks of training. They even had an instruction manual to help them. So what we have here is an original copy of the first set of regulations that were developed for the cavalry and their use of their swords. This was needed because early in the wars against the revolutionary French, the British were well below par, really. Yeah. Um, they fought with the Austrians in Flanders, and yeah. it was remarked that the British were more likely to do damage to themselves and their own horses than the enemy, such as their swordsmanship really? was so poor, yeah. Or when they were swinging the swords over the exactly. top of the horse's head. There was no standardised system yeah. of how to use their weapons. Cutting their ears off and stuff exactly. like that. Exactly, exactly, Sean, yeah. What's that there? That's this it. is the six cuts that they're taught. Mm -hmm. So this is what yeah. we've got marked out on the wall, yeah. and which David is going to show you. So it's the beginning of a scientific approach to cavalry combat by the British. Yeah. And this new system evidently works. So this book, this is, what is it? 17 something, isn't it? 1797. Yeah. So that's what, 18 years before the uh, Battle of Waterloo. Yeah. They're still using this system. Uh, at they? the time of Waterloo, yeah. yeah. There are six cuts which are all made starting from the guard position. One, two, three, four, five, six. When you think this actual book was knocking around at the time of Waterloo, and uh, a few years before, so who knows, you know, there could have been a British cavalryman who looked at this, flicked through the pages and honed his skills and maybe could have saved his life on that day, who knows. Right, David, I've read the book. Uh, I think I might have a go now. Yep, sure. Myself. Right. You need to slip that over your wrist. Oh, yeah. So if you let go, it doesn't fly off and hit oh, yeah. anybody. Yeah. And you need to let it play in your hand a little bit. Yeah. That's why the, the end's curved. Oh, yeah. Right. Now, the, the trick is, if you stand in front of it so you can't quite reach the wall when your arm's out straight. Yeah. Like stand that. square. You've got to stand square because you'll you be on a horse. Straight on like that. Like, like oh, yeah. That. You're on an horse. <laughs> and you have to keep that. your arm straight. Yeah. Don't bend the elbow because that gives the Frenchman a target. It's a bit complicated. Go on, <laughs> try it. All right. OK. I'm making these noises. I'm doing that. <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't do that on a battlefield, would you? No, I think you'd just <laughs> scream. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a burn. <laughs> the two hours it's, in the so morning. It's harder than you two think. Two hours in the morning. Yeah. Two hours All in the afternoon. The week after week until you get it absolutely right. Yeah. And then you do it on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to stage an experiment that's not been tried before. For the first time in 200 years, this heavy cavalry sword is being sharpened for action. We're going to test it alongside a lighter weapon to see which was most effective for the British in battle. Expert horseman Alan Larson will be the man in the saddle. This is Charlie. I know Charlie's going to do the job. He loves his work. Yeah. A pig's carcass is the closest we can get to matching the size and build of a human body. Some French cavalrymen wore armour at Waterloo, but most soldiers had to make do with more basic protection. We want to, as, uh, as much as we can, authenticate the width of the, the uniform and so that we can measure and get a good idea of the impact of the sword when Alan charges at the carcass. We'll be testing the swords in a controlled environment far from the chaos of battle. But travelling at speed with a razor-sharp killing machine in your hand is still a dangerous business. Huzzah! Coming up next, I see the deadly damage a sword can inflict. I meet a man whose ancestor charged with the Waterloo Cavalry. Even he wasn't remaining on his original horse. He, he was actually on a French horse when he finished.
We're testing the swords used by the British cavalry at Waterloo to find out how deadly they were. By early afternoon on the day of the battle, thousands of horsemen were charging at the French infantry. Some used heavy swords, others preferred the sabre. Between them, these weapons caused nearly 20% of the injuries at Waterloo. But which one was worse? So he's testing the uh, heavy cavalry sword on yes. this one? Yes, yeah. that's what we're doing first. Good shot, that, wasn't it? Good strike. Look at this. Yeah. Took his ear off. <laughs> well done, sir. It's a good start, but not the sort of injury a Waterloo horseman was aiming for. They wanted to put their enemy out of the battle for good. Camera's gone. Crap, crap. Alan's finding his range, but even a direct hit wasn't guaranteed to cause an injury. Yeah, it's gonna have a lot. I heard a bounce. Yeah, that yeah, cloak yeah, yeah. is a really thing. formidable piece of armour. Well, we've established that the roll cloak is pretty effective. Mm. So for the next one, do we want this sort of off a bit? That's it. Not every attack hit its target, but 2,000 horses took part in the first Allied cavalry charge, so the odds were stacked against the French infantry. Ooh, gosh, that's been pretty right effective, though, isn't it? Trotter is probably denser than it. I think you're right. Man's arm. I mean, when Alan hit the like hit it. the hand there, that like you say, that bone does feel yeah incredibly dense. So, that's pretty so this, is, I think, is the more stroke, yeah. yeah pretty gruesome. I could feel the bone crunch. That's a really weird feeling. As the Union Brigade cut through the French infantry at Waterloo, they changed the course of the battle. Flushed with success, they charged down the slope into the valley and up the other side to where Napoleon's cannon stood. So what's he doing now? Yeah. He's going to be using the, the point this time to try and thrust into the target. Is it a possibility he can get stuck and exactly. then break the sword or pull him off? Either or, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite a skill yeah. to extract it. That's why the British mainly cut with them is one of the reasons, because it's, it's quite risky. Corporal Dixon described the scene as thousands of horsemen ran riot amongst the French artillery. Such slaughtering. We sabred the gunners, lamed the horses and cut their traces and harness. I can hear the Frenchmen yet crying, Diable, when I struck at them, and the long-drawn hiss through their teeth as my sword went home. Wow, that's a great shot. So it completely shot, wrenched it? out of your hand? Yeah. Did it? Yeah. What we did to the arm, that's a disabling blow, but that, that's a killing blow. The heavy cavalry sword is bad enough, but now Alan's going to test a weapon that was even more feared by the foot soldiers of Waterloo. The light cavalry sabre was designed to cut and slash through enemy ranks. Like this. That will be better. It will take off arms. A couple of occasions you'll count be taking off heads. Mm -hmm. The injuries it caused were so horrific that the French had previously tried to ban it from the battlefield. Huzzah! I'm about to find out why. The damage. <laughs> it's, it's better balanced. It's lighter. It just feels more effective. If that was someone's arm, and it makes that kind of gaping wound. The slicing I mean, that's done some right blasting. damage. <sighs> it's confirmed everything that we really thought, that the light cavalry sword is a better cutting weapon than the heavy with the straight blade. To actually see these things in action, a, a, a big guy and a half a ton of horse, uh, a great big heavy cavalry sword like this flying at you, we, we, that must have been an absolutely terrifying and horrific experience and uh, it makes you wonder how those guys stood there and actually faced that. The heavy cavalry charges produced some of Waterloo's most legendary moments. And Jonathan Findlay's ancestor was there in the thick of the action. 
So, Jonathan, your ancestor was here at quite a critical moment of the battle, the charge of the Union Brigade, I believe. Indeed. Um, his name was James Weems, and he was a lieutenant in the Royal Scots Greys, who yeah. formed part of the Union Brigade. They had formed up over the ridge there, and they charged and hit the lines of the French infantry. But they then went on and targeted the French artillery. Yeah. And they managed to capture quite a few of those guns yeah. as well. It was a, a fairly decisive moment yeah. in the battle. They turned the tide of the battle, but then disaster struck. As their horses began to tire in the mud, the Allied cavalry were counter-attacked by French horsemen. I don't know the, the numbers for the entire Union Brigade, but the yeah. Scots Greys had started with about 400. Yes. Uh, about 200 were killed. Um, another 150 were uh, severely wounded. And my ancestor, James Weems, uh, says that he was one of the, uh, one of 26 remaining on the field to the last. But even he wasn't remaining on his original horse. His uh, favorite horse had actually been killed from under him. And he found himself in the, in the thick of it all. And luckily, one of the uh, Allied infantry found a French horse, gave it to him, and he, he oh, said no. he, he had, at them, uh, had at them again. After four hours of brutal combat, the battle hung in the balance. Wellington had beaten off the first French attacks, but his defences were stretched to breaking point, and he was desperate for his Prussian allies to arrive. They'd been marching since dawn from their camps in the east. With 10 miles to travel across difficult terrain, it took them hours to reach the battlefield, where casualties were rising by the minute. By the end of the day, 50,000 would be dead or injured. A similar number to the first day of the Somme, but the carnage at Waterloo was 10 times more concentrated because the whole battlefield measured less than three square miles. The density of the injured of all nations was huge on this battlefield, a 2,000 per square mile of front. Clearing them off the field was a huge challenge. And uh, for uh, the Allies, they had a big problem. You either limped off or you're on horseback, but the French had a better system. They had a system of ambulances, which weren't just vehicles, it was a system of frontline surgical support. And a vehicle like this could have been used. If you can imagine there was a boxed in bit on top here, yeah. and two men were slung in there, and you have this spring here, which keeps the jolting down to a minimum. Of course, you were moving over the dead, there was hardly any yeah. clear space to do it. It's uh, pretty basic, isn't it? I suppose it's better than nothing. Well, I think it is. The ambulances were basic, and so were the hospitals. This is Mont Saint Jean Farm. It's a thriving brewery today. Back then, it was a makeshift field hospital. Thousands of injured men were treated in this barn. I can't begin to imagine what sad and desperate size this building must have seen. This is how the barn might have looked 200 years ago. Well, Sean, this is a typical sort of building that would have been used as a temporary field hospital at Waterloo. And all the main surgeons would assemble here, sending the junior assistant surgeon of a regiment out in front with the battalion. And he'd have to do first aid. He'd have to treat injuries caused by musket balls or cannonball like that. Yeah. Was it iron? Solid, Solid iron. iron. Yeah. yeah. If that went through you, it'd smash you to pieces, well, it wouldn't it? Would just oh, kill you you're straight out. Well, that's a shrapnel. Yes, we actually oh. had shrapnel, the French didn't, but the French did have hollow shells filled with powder, and when they exploded, they blew yeah. bits of that into you. Really. And it all just blew to pieces. Yeah. Just, Absolutely, it just yeah. explodes on the God. ground or in the so air. So you just get a chunk of that and oh, frightful just injury. rip you yeah, absolutely. apart, wouldn't it? Okay. The British had about 180 trained doctors at Waterloo, one medic for several hundred soldiers. Overwhelmed by casualties, they had to make many life and death choices. Chantelle Taylor knows how that feels. She served as a frontline army medic in Afghanistan, where she became the first British woman to kill an enemy in combat. What's it like for someone such as yourself, a modern day medic, trying to work under those conditions and under that pressure? Well I think, I, I mean, I can talk about my single worst day. I remember when the call came in, um, 
having that sinking feeling of being told you've got mass casualties. As the casualties started to come in, um, we're trained in a thing called triage, which funnily enough is supposedly from the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah. You know, that it's French for to sort or to sieve out casualties. Yeah. And that's when you get to have to make the decision of who's going to get treated first. Our, our goal essentially is to get people back into the battle if we have to, you know, so mm. we had a soldier who had a very severe head injury. All of the signs were showing that he wasn't mm. going to make it by the time he got back to Bastion. Now, if I'd have got bogged down with that soldier, I'm, I could lose three mm. that needed simple yeah. things like tourniquets fitted. Yeah. When I started reading about some of the eyewitness accounts of Waterloo, it was, I was really intrigued by one. And it was one of the surgeons, he was fairly far forward, then moved back to a dressing station. And he said, what made the scene more depressing was the knowledge that it was impossible to afford relief to all or even a godly proportion of the sufferers. It was a cruel task to be obliged to tell a dying soldier who had served his king and country well on that day that his case was hopeless, more especially when he was unable to realise the same for himself and then to pass on to another where their skill might avail more. And that's, that's something that really touched me about the, the guys in Waterloo is that they had to make really harsh decisions about numbers of soldiers, you know, that would have been really tough. Yeah. I was just trying to imagine what it would, would be like. You know, I think about Waterloo and the, 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 the bodies and the screaming faces and, and just the anguish and the, and the horror. And so when we get casualties coming in, mm. everyone sort of envisages they're screaming out and they're crying out, but they're not yeah. because they're, they're waiting to be told what to do or what's happening, because that's how... Just waiting for direction. Um, yeah, our mindsets are, are, so, and yeah. yeah. And, and that's no bad thing. No. It, it works, you know? Soldiers don't change, it's just the battlefield that changes. Yeah. Coming up next, I get a crash course in battlefield surgery. Where's the rest of it? <laughs> <laughs> These look like weapons of war, but they saved lives at Waterloo. Army doctors amputated more than 2,000 limbs that day, a terrifying procedure in an age before anaesthetic. This is a big operation. Someone strong like you is going to have to put his hands and arms right round to keep his arms still. Where's the rest of it? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is just a, a workout yes. model. <laughs> You're holding him Sorry, down. Yeah. The yeah. skin would be pulled down on the leg while somebody put on the screw tourniquet here. Does that cut all the blood off from that? Yeah, that, that blood would off. cut the blood off completely. I thought it'd just be flying all over the place. Depends on the yeah. skill of the surgeon. Yeah. So now the first, <laughs> having got the tourniquet on and you holding him still and encouraging him and saying nice things, the yeah. surgeon will then make his first cut. You right-handed? Yes. Right, come on then. <laughs> so right. it's very right, awkward yeah. and it shows you how difficult the procedure was. You've got to go underneath. Yeah. Come up, now get your hand right round so that blade's pointing like at your heart. Yes, like that. Like right, that. Oh, God. Right. So we can start there. That's mm. good, that's perfect. Right. And round you go. That was called the coup de main by the French. That's the first cut. That's perfect. Couldn't have done it better myself. Brilliant. And then you do the muscle. Now, Sean, you get the tenon saw and you're going to saw gently but firmly and just push. Don't give an equal pressure both ways. It's push hard, pull back gently, OK? So push sure. hard and back gently. Push hard and back gently. Hard and gently. Keep going. <laughs> and we're trying to keep the soft tissues out of the way. OK, till the bone's divided. Yeah. Very good. It is said that the sawing of the bone was the most difficult part because the saw would jam if the bone ends move and the assistant didn't hold the limb right. And would they be sweating, really, just physically? Oh, I think bang. so, yes, yes. So it's hard work dividing yeah. bone, yeah. A well-trained surgeon could take off a leg in a couple of minutes. If they did the job quickly, you had a one in three chance of surviving. I'm amazed so many soldiers survived their devastating injuries. These portraits were drawn by Charles Bell, a surgeon who helped treat the injured in the weeks after the battle. He documented the names, ages and injuries of French and Allied soldiers who now lay side by side in the same Brussels hospital. Men like Samuel Pritchard. He survived a musket ball to the head and two months after the battle was well enough to travel home. These pictures by Charles Bell are incredible because they, 
kind of bring it home that these are men of real flesh and blood and they seem so much more revealing than kind of medical or clinical pictures. You uh, realise it's someone's father or someone's son. It could be you or me and someone walking past you in the street and it uh, kind of brings together, you know, the true face of human suffering at Waterloo. And I think they're amazing. Hmm. This is the portrait of another Waterloo veteran. Her amazing story has been pieced together by her descendant, Jane Leeper. Wow, so this is your great, great, great... Grandmother. Mother. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, she's Elizabeth Watkins. This is a picture taken in 1903, and she was 93 years old at the time. And she was yeah. interviewed because she was the uh, last surviving witness of the battle. And she yeah. was aged five at the time of the battle. Wow. What was she doing at that age, five-year-old at the Battle of Waterloo? She was the daughter of Daniel Gale and his wife Mary. Uh, Daniel had joined the Rifles yeah. in 1812. 95th uh, Rifles. The 95th Rifles. Yeah. The, the, the same one as yeah. yours, yes. <laughs> what, what rank was he? <laughs> <laughs> he was an ordinary soldier. You would have been oh, ordering yeah. him around. And um, uh, her mother, Mary, though, was with him. Uh, she was a camp follower. Yeah. And uh, she tried to get as close to the battle as she could. She followed him to Waterloo. Um, and then she helped out in a field hospital. Uh, during the battle. Right. Uh, Elizabeth remembered being given bandages, um, lint to pick, as it was called, yeah. uh, for bandages, uh, which her mother did to keep her busy. But despite that, she remembered the cloth falling from the face of a young soldier and seeing him lying dead with his face towards the battle. His eyes still open, staring yeah. towards the battle, was, was what she remembered. Yeah. And that memory of Waterloo remained with her all her life. For a five-year-old mm. to see. Mm. See that, I'm sure that stays with you forever. While Elizabeth and her mother worked inside the hospital, the road outside was a scene of chaos, as injured troops were moved in and out of the building. In the late afternoon, one of Napoleon's officers mistook the activity as a sign that Wellington was retreating. With nightfall and the Prussians approaching, he ordered a massive cavalry charge. 5,000 horses rode towards the ridge through the narrow corridor of land, half a mile wide, between the farms of Hugomont and Le Hay Song. With so many horses packed into such a small area, they were an easy target for Wellington's artillery, who fired at them with case shot and canister. We tested this fearsome ammunition with an original Waterloo cannon. Now, canister, you have lots of metal balls, maybe up to 80, inside a tin can, hence canister. And at short range, should kill a lot of enemy cavalry as they're galloping up the hill towards you. What we're looking at is close targets, but having wide effects. This is your last safe moment weapon of choice. Stand by, firing in five, four, Three, two, one, fire. British artillery officer Alexander Mercer described the scene of carnage as men and horses fell like grass before the mower's scythe. The very first round I saw brought down several men and horses, making terrible slaughter. We were a little below the level of the ground on which they moved, and this gave more effect to our case shot for the carnage was dreadful. What we're seeing is a dispersion of the canister shot, so we're taking out more than one target with every round that we fire. But canister alone wasn't enough to halt the cavalry. Coming up next, squaring up to Napoleon and face to face with a unique battlefield discovery. By late afternoon, Napoleon's cavalry had launched charge after charge against the Allied infantry. 
These Waterloo enthusiasts are practicing the formation used by Wellington's foot soldiers to defend themselves. I've been joined by a serving officer with the Coldstream Guards. We're here to speak to Rob Ewell. He's a retired major from the Rifles Regiment and a Waterloo expert. So these would be four ranks deep, two ranks kneeling, two ranks standing. You create a hedge of steel to keep the horses at bay and the horses just have more sense than the riders and will not go anywhere they near They won't go them. near those uh, no. bayonets, no? And then the rear two ranks would be firing continuously by rank, so there's always a rolling fire again. As the infantry squares formed, cannons continued to fire. Artillery, abandon the pace! And then, with the horses almost upon them, the crews ran for cover beneath the walls of bayonets. A battalion of between six to 800 men was expected to be able to form square in a minute and a half. And that's how well drilled they were. As soon as they heard that resist cavalry, it just happened. There were 36 allied squares in total, stretching from east to west across the ridge. If even a handful were breached, Napoleon had victory in his grasp. Obviously, forming square, you're concentrating yourself into a defended area so that the cavalry can't get out. But in that concentration, you create yourself into a target uh, that if the artillery can get out, uh, it'll have an effect on. When you are threatened both by artillery and by cavalry, you end up between a rock and a hard place. They were forced to remain in square uh, and presented a nice, big, juicy target for the cannons that kept on firing. And you have descriptions of a cannonball coming through the ranks and carrying away more than 20 men, and yet, of course, they would be equally uh, vulnerable if they broke from the square, yeah. then so they, they would, be, would be cut they, to pieces. They just so, to stay. Yeah, it must have been tremendously difficult for uh, to maintain good order and discipline. Yeah. Everybody's survival depends on each man doing his business. The squares took terrible punishment for nearly two hours. It was impossible to move a yard, wrote one young soldier, without treading upon a wounded comrade or upon the bodies of the dead, and the loud groans of the wounded and dying was most appalling. Have you ever been in that situation where, you, Charlie, where you're just stuck somewhere and you know, you're just taking fire and you just have to stay there? I can certainly recall um, one or two occasions um, in Afghanistan where you were stuck in a place from which you couldn't move yeah. and where you couldn't quite bring any effect to bear to break yourself out of it. So you sort of had to sit there and take it for a bit. It feels all wrong and I can only imagine that the idea of sitting in a square and hanging onto your musket and just taking it um, yeah. requires a particularly stolid sort of discipline. They were hard men, they had to be, to survive and exist in that environment. By early evening, the French cavalry attacks were over. Wellington's defences had been stretched to breaking point, but not a single square was broken. So, Charlie, you've got, you've got your modern-day soldier, and you've got one of these guys from uh, the Battle of Waterloo, 1815. Who would come out on top, do you think? From 300 metres, I think we would. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but I think if you, if you put us face to face um, with sharp, pointy implements. Um, yeah. I suspect my money would probably be on, be on the, the cold streamer of 1815, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why is that? What? Well, but generally speaking, the pattern of warfare now is not the hand-to-hand, face-to-face fighting. Never likely to see that again. Probably again. not. We practice with bayonets today, but they're mm. attached to little stubby automatic rifles, and it's one of those things that if you find yourself using a bayonet, you know everything else has gone wrong. Whereas that was the pattern of fighting. That was all about um, extreme, rapid violence. Wellington had waited all day for the Prussians to arrive from the east. Without their help, the odds of holding off the French until nightfall were 50-50 at best. The Prussians had marched since dawn. Now, at last, they were ready to join the fight. Some were poised to link up with Wellington's left flank. Others were attacking the rear of Napoleon's position through the village of Plancenois. The kit might be different, but these soldiers, training on Salisbury Plain, understand what the Prussians went through as they fought for control of the village. There are certain things that remain unchanged about warfare. The, the general chaos, the lack of information, the fear, the fact that you're in danger, the fact that um, other people are trying to do violence to you and you don't necessarily know where they are, what their intentions are or how to do it. Um, 
And so the techniques and the equipment might look very different, but I think those things certainly endure from Waterloo. Plant Noir became a bloodbath as French and Prussian soldiers fought with bayonets through the narrow lanes. If you're attacking a village 200 years ago or attacking a village today, there are people defending that village who wish to keep you out. You have to find a way to neutralize the harm they can do you and then get through their defenses and clear the village out. The fight for Plants and Noir took some of Napoleon's elite troops away from the main battle, but he had others in reserve. And now was the time to use them. With nightfall looming, 4,000 soldiers of the Imperial Guard launched a final all-out assault. As they reached the ridge, a brigade of British guards who'd been hidden in a cornfield unleashed a devastating volley of musket fire, followed by a bayonet charge. After 10 minutes of chaotic fighting, the demoralized French began to retreat. Once Napoleon's elite troops were beaten, the rest of his army knew the game was up. After nine hours of bloody combat, the Allied forces of Wellington and Blucher had claimed an unlikely victory. Jolly game, well done, boys. 50,000 men were killed or injured at Waterloo, enough to fill a football ground as big as Liverpool's Anfield Stadium. We're about half an hour away from Waterloo on an industrial estate. But apparently, there's something I've got to see here. Some became famous because of their feats in the battle. Others were forgotten by history. OK, so this is the skeleton of a soldier killed in action during the Battle of Waterloo. And it's the only and the first one that we discovered during modern excavation. Farmers sometimes bring some bones they found uh, when they work on the fields, but that's the first complete skeleton we dig in a scientific yeah. way. Look, his skull, his teeth, everything. Yeah. Never seen a skeleton before, so... Yeah. It's been <laughs> kind of like this, so it's a mm. strange sensation. That, that's the, the original position of the yeah. bones when we found it on the field. Yeah. Uh, it was behind the English lines, 400 metres, near the English ambulance. Is and that the hospital? The field hospital, yes, absolutely. And uh, probably was wounded on the front line. Yeah. And he goes back to rest and to try to, to recover. And then he died probably uh, soon after. Dominique is trying to piece together the story of this unfortunate man. These flints discovered near the body would fit the muskets used by the Allied troops. These coins also suggest that he fought with Wellington's men. So he had quite a lot of money yeah. on him at the time. Uh, it represents one month of pay for a trooper. Some of these coins are from Hanover in modern day Germany. So he was probably a member of a Hanoverian regiment. Dominique discovered other personal items near the body, but nothing to indicate the soldier's name. Was he in very good health, this man? No, in fact, no. no. It's a little guy, a guy and yeah. uh, the bones are very thin, so it's not a strong guy, and he has yeah. a, a very strong infirmity of the spine, which we call spina bifida, that yes. you can see over there. If you have that sure. today, you, you, you'll never be a soldier. Um, oh, so he wasn't in good shape? Then, no, he? no, he was not yeah. in good shape. Mm. They need everybody, probably, to, yeah. <laughs> to yeah. fight against Napoleon. Yeah. I bet he was in a lot, maybe in a lot of pain then, wasn't he? Poor fella. No, it's, it's not a very strong guy. No. This is the only skeleton from Waterloo to be discovered in the exact position where the soldier died. He was in his early 20s, and his body must have been covered by earth within minutes of his death, which is why he lay hidden for almost 200 years. Is that uh, the bullet? Yeah, that's, that's the bullet, the yes, which killed him. Can I open it? Yeah, yeah, please, do yeah. it. That's heavy, isn't it? Yeah, that's 21 gram heavy. Yes. That's a French bullet. Is it? Yeah. How do you know that? It's... Because the English oh. ones were bigger. That's, um, that's amazing to think that's what killed this man. Yeah. It's funny, I've, I've fired the, the, the musket in the, the Royal Armouries in, uh, in Leeds in England, and I know they're very powerful, but uh, 
to actually hold a lead ball that ended someone's life. That's mm -hmm. a, a very sobering thought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go put it back. <laughs> Seeing all this laid out before me today, it's kind of learning how the man fell, how he died, maybe on the way to the field hospital, maybe helped by his mates who had to leave him. And learning a little bit about his condition. He was a small guy, hunched over, probably uh, dragged into the army against his will, maybe a conscript. And then just seeing the few possessions that he had, his spoon, <laughs> and then the musket ball that killed him. It's a very uh, strange feeling. We'll never know this man's name, uh, who his family were, his loved ones, whether he had children, his mother, which village you were from. Simple things like that. But in a strange kind of way, this has brought me closer to the, the, the real soldiers of Waterloo who, who fought and died than just about anything else I've seen. It's a very poignant sight. <laughs> After he'd lost the battle, Napoleon escaped into the night. He surrendered on the 15th of July and ended his days in exile on the remote island of St Helena. The man who defeated him became a national hero. Wellington. His victory cemented Britain's place as a major world power and paved the way for almost 50 years of peace in Europe. But it was won at a terrible cost. Thank God, said Wellington. I don't know what it is to lose a battle, but nothing can be more painful than to gain one with the loss of so many of one's friends. Ever since I played Sharp, I've been fascinated by the story of Waterloo, especially the ordinary soldiers. It's been interesting. I've been able to step out of my ordinary life and just learn a bit more. Even though all this happened 200 years ago, I think it's a story that needs to be remembered. The people there, they were just like you and me.